Welcome to episode 77 of the G2 on 5G. It's the latest insight scoop on everything 5G. We cover six topics in about 15 minutes, and it's brought to you by More Insights and Strategy. I'm Will Townsend, and joining me again this week is fellow analyst Anshul Sag. Let's get started with my first topic. And AWS reInvent just occurred this past week, and there were several announcements related to areas that I cover with respect to network and security, but I want to talk about one announcement in particular. AWS launched its private 5G as a service. So the question is, is this a game changer? On the surface, it's multi-vendor, and so it's sort of a Chinese menu of pick your core, pick your RAN, and Amazon hopes to integrate all of this together. What, what I do like about it is that they're offering starter kits um, that contain you know, the, the right number of you know, pieces of infrastructure for an enterprise to get started. Right. So that's nice, kick the tires on it. The other thing that I like about their approach is that they are going to meter on throughput versus SIM and device. So this gets back to allowing enterprises to start small and grow. Now, the only thing that was a little fuzzy for me was on the integration. So it is multi-vendor, so it's not going to be easy. Certainly, AWS will be leaning into its experience with DISH. If you've been following that, Amazon is going to be a big part of Dish's rollout, but it seems like everyone else in the disaggregated universe will be as well. But at the end of the day, it's quite compelling on the surface. And from my perspective, this brings another company into the fold. There are a lot of different companies that are vying for, uh, for private 5G as a service. And typically, when you've got competition, that breeds innovation and cost competitiveness. But would love to get your take, buddy. Yeah, you know, I was a bit surprised by this because obviously I didn't get pre-briefed like you were. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, you know, a lot of people's initial reactions were, is this going to compete with the ISPs and the, the um, you know, the, the big um, carriers, right? Right. And it seems like it's such a um, small step that it almost feels like it's a step towards allowing the carriers to grow a private 5G with AWS. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that there is a considerable amount of um, uncertainty around uh, AWS's role in enabling private 5G versus the carriers. And I think that there's going to be a, con a continuous um, back and forth between the two um, trying to figure out who fits in where and how. Um, mm -hmm. Because I saw a recent story that um, in Europe, the ISPs are wanting the CSPs to pay for their network upgrades. So mm -hmm. there's, there's definitely a certain level of animosity that I think is inherently there because, you know, I think the carriers want to take advantage of, you know, 5G and, and, and grow their businesses. But at the same time, they aren't doing remotely as much work as the CSPs are to enable it. Right. I agree. I also believe that there are multiple routes to market with private 5G. So a slice of a public carrier network, as well as, you know, as a service solutions, a company called Salona has been in market. I've spoken about Salona in the past. They're leveraging HPE's channel to, um, drive and find opportunities there. And I expect Dell with its Apex IT consumption model will be offering 5G as a service. And I wouldn't be surprised if Cisco does the same down the road. So there will be conflict here, but um, you know, I believe choice is a good thing, but we'll, uh, we'll see how it turns out. But let's go to your first topic this week. And you just got back from Hawaii and you were with Qualcomm at the Snapdragon Tech Summit. And you want to share some of your insights from that event. Yeah, so I just got back. I haven't even had a chance to unpack because I got in so late last night. <laughs> um, and yeah, it was a three-day event. I was there for, for five days, but, you know, the beginning and end are usually, trend, you know, people coming in and out. Um, so it was three days jam-packed. Um, there were three really big announcements. Um, and then there were some other kind of, 
side announcements that w w came along with that. But the big three were one, the Snapdragon 8 Gen 1. So they've now changed the numbering scheme away from a three digit scheme and are doing a single number and just talking about generations. Um, we'll see what happens when they have more than one product in each category. Um, uh, that'll be interesting to see what they do there. But um, I think that the uh, 8 Gen 1 is interesting because it has a Snapdragon X65 modem, which is the best modem Qualcomm makes today. Mm -hmm. And it has all the capabilities of 5G um, and it's, you know, an integrated modem. So it's, it's, it's going to be a really solid product overall. Um, and, it, you know, it adds all kinds of carrier aggregation across millimeter wave, mid band, low band. Um, and, you know, they're saying that it's capable of 10 gigabits per second, um, which is a big deal because, you know, that's, that's way faster than what people have expected from 5G ever. Um, it's kind of the peak, but the funny part is we had a discussion, we were talking about what carrier has enough spectrum to allow 10 gigabits per second to begin with, mm -hmm. um, because you need multiple carriers in the mid band in addition to carriers uh, in, in millimeter wave. But um, it's a very powerful processor, has all the latest IP from ARM on the CPU side, and it also has, uh, you know, the latest GPU IP, you know, a crazy ISP, um, has basically all the top features, all the top cores that Qualcomm has in terms of IP. Um, then the 8CX Gen 3 is their PC processor uh, for Windows on ARM. Um, they like to say Snap Windows on Snapdragon, but I I'm optimistic that, that there will be other vendors that, that do Windows on ARM. Um, and it sounds like there's going to be announcements coming down the road next year at Build, um, where Microsoft and will announce more um, ARM-friendly software developments, which have been a long time coming and will likely be part of Windows 11. Um, and then the big announcement that no one was expecting was the new Snapdragon G3X, which is a gaming-focused processor, mm -hmm. um, which is specifically actually going to go into a handheld gaming um, developer device, which is like a, you know, the best way to compare it to is like a Switch. Um, mm -hmm. And it will it has cellular connectivity, including 5G, uh, as well as Wi-Fi 6, which none of the other handhelds have. And it will run Android games and also stream stuff like Xbox Game Pass and has very low barrier to entry for a developer because it basically runs the same drivers and a lot of the same software as um, a regular smartphone would, but with a built-in controller and a bigger battery and you know, better mm -hmm. antennas and a forward facing camera for streaming. So that was a partnership that they actually announced with Razer and Razer's helping them um, get it to, in developers hands and refine the project to a point where um, the next version of this will be actually be a commercial, a commercial device for consumers as opposed to this one, which is a developer device. I was um, going to ask you that. So this is designed as a platform, obviously, for developers. Do we expect other OEMs beyond Razer to develop form factors based on the Qualcomm reference design? Yeah, I think the expectation is absolutely. Um, I think Razer was the first because I think Razer was a very natural fit for this. Mm -hmm. um, and Razer was, you know, they have a great reputation in gaming. And this kind of helps them revive their mobile gaming side because they, they used to have a mobile gaming phone project, which they killed. Um, and I think this is a much better avenue for them because it's a lot less costly for them to do. Um, there's a lot less upkeep. Um, and they're going to be able to work with Qualcomm down the road to, to maybe release a consumer product based on this. And others will too. And I hope that there will be multiple versions because, you know, not everyone's going to want to have cellular built in. Not everybody's going to want to use an OLED. And yeah. Qualcomm did say that they're, this is the G3X, which is the top of the line in their lineup there will be a g2 and a g1 and they're saying that the g1 might even be you know a streaming only device so a handheld that's really light and really cheap that only streams games through the cloud um, yeah. which would definitely require a modem but could be fully subsidized by carriers to the yeah. point where it would be free and you just pay for um, the service plus the game the game streaming so that would be a really interesting model and i'm really hoping that's some that's something that comes fairly soon I think that would be interesting when you think about 5G and, you know, it's sub five millisecond low latency when we get to standalone and how that'll unlock 
mobile, you know, low latency mobile gaming, cloud gaming, to your point. And I agree with you. I mean, that would be a very compelling product to to bundle with a service potentially. So um, exciting stuff. Well, um, get some sleep, but uh, we still have a few more minutes left in our podcast, buddy. Let me go to my second topic this week, and I want to talk about uh, Japan. And news broke this week that, in general, the Japan it's the Japanese Ministry. We've talked about these guys before of technology um, is, you know, very bullish behind Open RAN. And, you know, my question is, I mean, are they late to the party? Not necessarily. We've talked about Rakuten on prior calls um, and podcasts. They are, you know, leading the charge from my perspective with, you know, with respect to disaggregation and that sort of thing. What I found interesting was that one of the reasons why the Japanese government is wanting to invest in these proof of concepts next year is that um, they believe that it can do for it like what the U.S. wants to have happen with with Open RAN, domesticate the supply chain and get ecosystem partners within Japan involved in that you know those deployments. So you know, Open RAN and it's going to have its challenges. You know it definitely has its capex and opex benefits. Challenges being from an integration perspective, but. There's so many people that are focused on it. It's going to eventually work itself out, but would love to get your input here. Yeah, I don't think it's really, if anybody's trying to do open RAN now, they're, it's, they're probably ahead of the curve. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that it will, like your, to your point, it will be a longer journey, but I think inevitably um, it will be an option for people based on, what their needs are. And I think it, it's always good for people to have choice when they're looking to deploy 5G and having open RAN as an option, I think will ultimately be better for the industry mm -hmm. and hopefully allow people to deploy 5G that otherwise might have not been able to or might not have wanted to. I agree. And I think I've spoken to this before that the opportunity that open RAN also presents is a lower uh, CapEx investment, which potentially would help with the economics in deploying in rural. But we've also on prior podcasts talked about FWA, fixed wireless access being a part of that, satellite being a part of that. So all of these different, you know, technology platforms are coming together in, in my mind. And so it's, it's an exciting time and we'll continue to kind of keep tabs on this. But let's move to your second topic this week. And you want to talk about Verizon and AT&T and some insights around their C-band deployment. Yeah, so this news actually came out late last week, um, but I, I must have missed it or not covered it, and I feel bad about it. But nonetheless, it's important news to cover, so I want to talk about it. Sure. Um, and it's the fact that you know Verizon and AT&T have decided to um, delay, or not delay, but reduce their power levels for their C-band deployment in order to um, appease the FAA and get their rollouts going instead of continuing to delay beyond January. Um, and I'm not sure if they even accepted it yet. Um, FCC has been actually going through some um, interesting uh, political fights for confirmations. Um, I think Rosenworcel was confirmed, but Gigi Sohn um, is being uh, fought at this point, mm -hmm. um, but we'll see what happens in terms of the FCC itself and what they decide to do there. But ultimately, I think that lowering their power levels is going to be problematic because yeah. you know their their deployment model is based on full power, um, and especially Verizon um, having the less least dense network out of everybody um, is going to have a very interesting time having enough coverage, and you know. As somebody who's been on T-Mobile and has witnessed their 2.5 gigahertz rollout, I can say it has gotten considerably better now at this point in the year compared to the beginning of the year. But I would say it's nowhere near complete. Um, and I would say, you know, I'm seeing, you know, mid-band about 30% of the time, mm -hmm. um, which is not something that I would consider a technology that you would totally rely on. Yeah. Um, and, if, and if it took T-Mobile basically a year to get to this point, um, I think it's going to be very difficult for Verizon and AT&T to, to even get to 30% coverage. The interesting part is T-Mobile claims that they have 200 million pops. 
mm -hmm. um, which is two thirds of the population. But I, mm -hmm. I, from my experience, you know, I, I only see UC about 30% of the time. And when I do, it's incredibly fast. But uh, I think that plugging those holes in coverage is going to be much harder when you have limited power. Um, and hopefully it's, it's a short-term problem or a short-term fix. Um, but ultimately, these older aircraft are going to have to install filters and somebody's going to have to pay for it. Um, mm -hmm. I just hope that it isn't the carriers because they already put up like $90 billion for the spectrum. <laughs> and some right. of that should have just been set aside for this. Yeah, I mean, it's, I continue to kind of chuckle about this. You know, how could two governmental agencies not coordinate better when this was known for over a year for quite some time? And, you know, C-band already was going to have its challenges with, you know, just the profile of the spectrum and the need for densification, you know, in that three plus range versus, you know, 2.5 that, that T-Mobile holds from, from its Sprint acquisition. So, yeah, it's just, uh, it's, it's sort of mind blowing, but it's drama and we'll continue to monitor it and, uh, and report back. But let me talk about my third and final topic this week, and I'm going to give our viewers and listeners a double shot of Orion. And so this week, China Mobile was very public around its uh, consideration of, of Open RAN. And so the question is, does this threaten Huawei's sort of 5G last day and presence in the region? Huawei has been on the sideline with respect to Open RAN. They have not been supportive. Nokia and Samsung have been the most aggressive. Recently, Ericsson has you know, sort of you know, made some, some advances in that, in that direction, noting that it's likely a reality. But this potentially has you know, some real challenging implications for Huawei. I mean, China Mobile executives were quoted recently stating that it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when this is gonna happen. And I didn't know this as I dug into it, there are over 40 Chinese companies that are actually members of the Oran Alliance. So that makes the China effort only second to that of the US. And so there are a lot of Chinese companies that are focused on Open RAN and we'll, we'll make it happen eventually. But I, I would love to get your take on this. I mean, do you feel like this threatens Huawei? I, I think it does, but would love to get your opinion. I think it does to a degree if Huawei doesn't embrace it. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately, Open RAN and ORAN are, are about competition. Yeah. And, um, you know, Huawei has, su has succeeded because of its competitiveness with the legacy um, companies like Ericsson, Nokia. So mm -hmm. I think that ultimately this is almost kind of like Huawei getting a little bit of its own medicine in terms of, you know, local competition. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think a lot of these Chinese companies are, are doing this because they see ORAN and Open RAN as like a opportunity to broaden their markets sure. and to become potential, you know, um, vendors across the world um, in countries that maybe aren't as close to having Chinese vendors and potentially come in at a lower price than Huawei. Mm -hmm. We live in interesting times, let me tell you. But let's move to your third and final topic this week. And there was big news around the FTC suing to block NVIDIA's acquisition of ARM. And you want to provide some insight into how that could affect the 5G ecosystem. Yeah, so there has been a lot of opposition to this merger. Um, you know, I think some people have seen the synergies there, and there definitely are in terms of they actually don't have too many conflicting um, businesses where you know, NVIDIA could definitely to benefit from acquiring merger or acquiring ARM. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately the problem is, is that one, the European Commission is against it. Two, the UK's own uh, internal body for competition uh, and foreign investment is against it. And now mm -hmm. the FTC is suing. Um, and, and I think the big problem here is um, ARM is seen as a neutral entity uh, supplying all of the biggest world's biggest smartphone vendors with CPU cores, GPU cores, and a lot of their um, IP is also in 5G modems. So mm -hmm. um, this is a big deal because you know NVIDIA is a licensee of ARM, and they are going out and trying to buy them. And a lot of ARM's 
current partners aren't particularly jazzed about that. <laughs> and um, I think it threatens arms business. Um, and I think it also it clearly the FTC thinks it, it harms competitiveness in the market um, because even though Nvidia says that they you know will treat arm as a separate business and and won't get involved in what they do with their customers, you know I don't really know if anyone really believes that. Um, right. And that's ultimately the problem. But uh, on top of that, you know the big reason why this is all happening is because SoftBank currently owns arm, and mm-hmm. SoftBank is in a fairly precarious financial position um and originally the acquisition was 30 billion dollars and you know softbank was going to get most of their money back and now because nvidia's share price has gone up it's actually a 75 billion dollar merger so um softbank really wanted this to happen because they were going to make a big profit which they needed because they've been losing a lot of money in a lot of their investments so um it's a really weird situation um the FTC has a new chair who is very anti um, big merger. So this may be a part of that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I think her last name is Khan. I forget her first name, but yeah. um, she's very um, antitrust and has been very um, crit- critical of a lot of mergers. So this is probably a component of that as well. And I just think that when you look at overall climate today, um, this has this has actually gr- helped grow um, some other uh, com- competitors to ARM, like um, Risk Five and all of their partners. Because you know, before before this merger was announced, those companies had a lot less attention and a lot less momentum than they do now. And I think that um, because ARM and SoftBank have opened Pandora's box, I'm not sure they'll ever actually be able to close it back up again. Yeah. It's interesting. I see the concerns, you know, around, you know, to your point, given the fact that ARM supplies all of those components to so many different, you know, OEMs. But it'll be interesting to see how this all winds out. It it's not looking very good at this point, right? When when you no, look at what's I mean, happening in the U.S. and other parts of the world. When you look at when you look at ARM's customers, they're the MediaTek's, they're the Qualcomm's, they're the Nvidia's. But there's also a bunch of server vendors too that also care about this because NVIDIA is also in the server space. So mm-hmm. it's it's a very complicated situation and nobody really knows what will happen to ARM if this gets fully blocked, which honestly at this point with three different regulatory agencies being against it, I think it's going to be very difficult for it to go through. Yeah. Well, we'll uh, keep tabs on it and we'll report back likely on future podcasts, but Hey, my friend, another great uh, session. Why don't you take us home? Absolutely. We hope our viewers and listeners found this week's topics interesting. If anyone would like to reach out for and provide insights for a future topic, uh, for a future podcast, please reach out to us on social media. Will is at Will Town Tech and I'm at Amshel Saad. We hope you have a great weekend and please tune in next week.